Today, the Southeast Asia program at the university that I reside in and teach at, Stanford, um, has an extraordinary opportunity, a really unusual and extraordinary opportunity, namely to examine an event that took place very recently on the 14th of May, a matter of a couple of weeks ago, whose reverberations are moving out from Thailand already and certainly are affecting in one way or another, for better or for worse, the future of that country in Southeast Asia. And I am delighted, beyond delighted, that we have two ideal commentators uh, who will discuss uh, the situation there now, the likelihood of certain events of taking place in the future, the run-up to that situation in context, and hopefully we'll have time during the Q&A to entertain your own questions on the important issue as to whether or not, I'm putting it perhaps uh, a little bit optimistically, but whether or not Thailand is on the cusp of a whole new era, a whole new political future in which democracy, which has behaved, uh, uh, how can I put it, uh, Thailand has uh, known as uh, the place uh, where, you know, there's one coup after another, and obviously authoritarian rule has has uh, has held sway for some time uh, off and on in Thailand. Uh, have they broken with that future or not? And the two individuals that uh, are going to be speaking uh, shortly are uniquely qualified, not only by their academic credentials and their understanding of Thailand and their interest in Thailand and their expertise on Thailand, but by the fact that both of them were present for the election itself. Uh, they were there in Bangkok watching it unfold. And so we have eyewitness reports in addition to the uh, the scholarly knowledge uh, that they represent. I'll be very brief in my introductions. Alan Hicken uh, has uh, uh, twice held visiting scholar positions in Thailand. He uh, has many publications. Uh, he is a professor of political science at the University of Michigan. He just published a co-authored book on elections and political machines in Southeast Asia. His higher degrees are from UC San Diego and Columbia University. Ken Mathids Lohatapanan while pursuing his doctorate at the University of Michigan, writes regularly for the Bangkok-based Thai Enquirer, previously worked on economic policy innovation for the Thailand Development Research Institute, and interned with the Bangkok Post. His BA is from UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. Alan, would you like to start, or Ken, would you prefer to start? I guess I can go ahead and, and start. Ken, you wanna, uh, we're gonna uh, slap up just a few, uh, we promise not too much, but just a few slides to, um, kind of set the context a little bit here. Um, so I'm going to start with just a few minutes, just giving us a bit of background, and then Ken will uh, talk about the election itself. And then we look forward to a, 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 a fruitful discussion uh, about the context and about the road forward. Um, uh, so Ken, you can do the next slide. Uh, so just again, as a political primer for those of you who um, may be newer to Thailand, uh, again, I could be in professor mode and, and talk for two hours on this, uh, this little timeline here, but let me just give you just some, some highlights. So 1997 was a real watershed in Thailand. Uh, we have two events uh, that um, that were important and linked in really important ways. In 1997, the Asian financial crisis, which helped um, bring about the passage of a new constitution that had been in development actually for some years. But uh, the, con the, the Asian financial crisis really puts a focal point on that, uh, that constitution and the draft passes, uh, which in, is, is changes in many fundamental ways, Thailand's institutions and ushers in uh, the election of uh, in 2001 of Taksin Shinawat and his uh, Thai Rak Thai party, uh, uh, the first time uh, in Thai elected history uh, where a party nearly won a majority after the election, uh, another smaller party joins with Thai Rak Thai and they actually, uh, for the first time, we have majority government in Thailand, although it does have a members of its coalition. And we really have a sort of fundamental sea change in the way that uh, Thai politics operates with the party um, that is not just first among equals, but is first um, and is able to sort of wield power on its own uh, without necessarily needing the support of its coalition members. Taksin and, and, and Thai Dark Thai run again in 2005 and win a landslide, easily win a, a supermajority of parliament. Uh, but that sets up um, a reaction against Taksin and his consolidation of power that uh, uh, finally uh, results in uh, street protests and a military coup uh, in 2006, where Taksin is thrown out of power. Uh, he goes into exile. Uh, Thai Rak Thai is, uh, um, is banned and dissolved. Uh, its top leadership is banned from politics. Uh, and uh, we have the military um, uh, uh, staying in power for about a year, writing a new constitution, holding new elections in 2007, 
seven, uh, which are then run by the successor of Thai Rak Thai, uh, Palam Prat, uh, Palam Prat, uh, um, and uh, headed by an ally of, uh, of Thaksin. Uh, they are able to remain in power for a couple of years until street protests and judicial action forces that party, uh, dissolves that party, forces that coalition from office. Uh, the Democrats uh, form a new government uh, uh, and rule until uh, we have uh, new elections in 2011. Those elections, again, are won by the successor uh, by a Thaksin-linked party, this time known as Puyo Thai, the current uh, party still in the system, uh, headed by Ying Lak Shinawat, uh, Thaksin's sister. Uh, they win uh, pretty convincingly in that election and are in power for a number of years, uh, three years, and then finally ousted, the less than three years, finally ousted in a coup in 2014. I'll just note that those elections, uh, so that every election that we've had since that 97 constitution had been fairly convincingly won by, uh, by uh, a toxin-linked party. Um, that had been the, the sort of trend. The, um, uh, we have uh, the military, when they seize power in 2000, uh, 2014, unlike uh, in earlier eras where they had uh, stayed in power for a year or two, rewritten the institutions to their favor, and then quickly exited from power. This time, the military stays on for the long haul. Uh, we don't have elections uh, returning until 2019. Uh, they uh, make two attempts to write the constitution, the second of which sticks in 2017, a new constitution that is written uh, as, uh, as a way to ensure that, or try and make sure that uh, the military is able to ensconce itself in power, uh, that figures like Thaksin uh, can never return to power again in Thailand, uh, and which sets up supervisory institutions that make it very difficult for democratic governments to come to power and uh, make a mess of things uh, as, uh, as the conservative forces would, uh, would consider it. Um, we can talk more about that if people are interested in the Q&A. We finally get a new election in 2019. Thai actually ends up winning uh, that election, but is unable to form a coalition. Instead, uh, Prayut um, uh, Chanocha, the, uh, the head of the coup group, uh, extends his uh, term as prime minister as the uh, chosen prime minister by the, uh, by the military back party, Palam Pracharat. And uh, the, the surprising thing, the um, Thai is the um, is the winner, but was unable to unable to, to capture capture power. The surprise second or third place party in that election is the Progressive uh, Future Forward uh, uh, Future Forward Party. Not too long after the election is complete, the, its leader is um, charged and banned from politics, and uh, the party itself is dissolved, triggering mass protests that last for about a year, um, uh, not just in Bangkok, in Bangkok, but throughout uh, throughout the uh, the country. That sort of sets the stage. So the um, the, the few, uh, probably is able to, to, to come to power, uh, putting together a, a coalition that is a huge, unwieldy coalition uh, uh, that, uh, um, uh, despite the fact that it's, uh, it's got lots of micro parties, is able to last the full four years. Um, uh, as this election sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, ramps up in 2023, we have um, on uh, the sort of Conservative side, uh, the, the the folks who had backed and been allied with Prayut, and uh, the sort of biggest players are the United Thai Nation Party, uh, Palam Pracharat. Uh, Ken will talk about a little bit more about those two in just a minute. Uh, the Boom Jai Thai Party, which is a sort of traditional locally based machine party that was trying to go national. Uh, the Democrat Party, the oldest party in Thailand that had uh, suffered a major defeat in the in the 2019 election and was trying to make a comeback, and Chatai Pathana. And on the opposition, we had the Move Forward Party, uh, the successor to Future Forward, the party that had been dissolved, the Progressive Party, Pua Thai, uh, the toxin linked party headed now by his, uh, his daughter. Ken will talk about that in a minute. Uh, Prachachat, uh, Siri Rum Thai, and Thai Sung Thai as sort of the major opposition figures. And I will, I'll, I'll turn the, the floor to Ken and he'll take us through some of the key characters. Yep, so I'll go to some of the uh, many characters that make Thai politics so colorful. The key candidates for, that were nominated for prime minister this time were Prayut. So as Alan talked about, Prayut was the, uh, the incumbent prime minister who uh, ran, decided to run for a third term. And Prampachart nominated General Brabit. And the interesting thing is that Prayut and Brabit used to uh, belong to the same party. So Prayut was actually nominated by Plum Pashart in 2019. But then, and Prayut and Brabit had actually been, uh, been ruling a triumvirate with another general since the military coup in 2014. They were known for being extremely close. They hailed from the same military faction and they, it, it, it wasn't 
player of when this started, but a rift began to emerge in the past couple of years between Brut and Brut, where uh, Brut began welcoming in figures into the Plum Party that were hostile to Brut. And then these figures in the party had attempted to depose Brut in a parliamentary vote last year. And it seems that these events led Brut to, to decide to split off and run in his own party with his own trusted aides, which meant that for, unlike in 2019, there wasn't a clear military-backed party. The Brie and Brevet were competing against each other, even though nominally they were still in the same government. On the, uh, on the opposition side, uh, Puyat Thai had decided to run Pathan Thanh Shinawat as their main uh, prime minister candidate. So Pathan Thanh is actually Thaksin's daughter. She doesn't have extensive experience in politics, a little bit like Ying Lok, Thaksin's sister, when she also ran for prime minister in 2011. But uh, Puyat Thai also nominated two other uh, more experienced figures to try to uh, steady the ship a little bit, but Patham Tom was the main the main face of the party for this election. Meanwhile, the Move Forward Party had emerged as the uh, successor to the Future Forward Party, the Progressive Party that had been dissolved in 2020. And Pita Lim Jirendrat, who was the party leader, was nominated their sole prime minister candidate. He's a relatively young figure, Harvard educated, doesn't quite inspire the same passion as Tana Torin, the leader of the Future Forward Party, did back when he was leading the Future Fort Party, but still immensely popular with Tan and Fiyut. And then we have two other parties that were a part of a brief coalition. One of them was Pum Jai Thai Party, which as Alan discussed, was, is a more locally based party, more focused on patronage politics. Their main campaign in 2019 was uh, legalizing marijuana for, uh, for medical purposes, but things happened. One thing led to the other, and in the end, it seems like marijuana has been legalized in Thailand almost basically for recreational purposes as well. And that led both to, you know, popular support for Anutin from people who favored uh, legalization and also a lot of blowback from people who were worried about drugs. Anutin had hoped to uh, score enough seats to actually nominate himself for prime minister this time around. Meanwhile, for the Democrat Party, the Democrat used to be one of the uh, one of Thailand's biggest parties. It's Thailand's uh, oldest currently existing party, and but the party had suffered a serious setback in 2019 when they, they had announced that they wouldn't support Brut for prime minister. That setback led them to uh, go back on their word. They joined Brut's coalition, and their new leader Jirin, who's who was who became deputy prime minister in Brut's government, ran ran tr uh, trying to uh, essentially retain the number of seats that they have right now. The election results were extremely surprising for all observers of Thai politics. The main expectation going in was that Pua Thai, Thaksin's party, would score the largest number of seats as they have at every single election since 2001. That move forward would probably do well based on the polling, but not gain more than, you know, 70 or 80 seats. While uh, the more, the, the bigger mystery was how the conservative parties, the military aligned parties would do. But on election night, it became clear that a massive upset had happened and that Move Forward actually gained the most seats out of all the parties. This was something that very few people saw coming. Pua Thai, for the first time in, since 2001, became uh, the second biggest party, while the, uh, the former coalition parties all underperformed expectations. So Pum Thai Thai, they had hoped for about 100 seats. They gained 70 seats instead. Plan Prashat, under Puyut's leadership, had uh, gained about 120 seats at the last election. This time they got only 40. The United Thai Nation Party, which Bayut had run with, only got 36 seats. And the Democrats, which had held 50 seats at the last election, now only held 25. The other interesting observation about these results is the massive discrep discrepancy between the constituency seats and the party list seats. So the new constitution had initially in 2019 only had one ballot where people would uh, would only uh, vote for one party and then in, in their constituency and then the electoral commission would then calculate the party list seats based on based on the total number of votes but the constitution had been amended uh, two years ago leading to uh, two ballots where people would vote for both a constituency uh, MP but also uh, vote for a party on the party list and it became very clear that uh, move forward which had not been expected to do well in the constituencies actually won in many seats, both in urban areas and rural areas, defeating expectations. 
while uh, it also became clear that many of the conservative parties that underwhelmed in the party list seats, Plum Prashad only won one seat, Poon Zaytai only won three seats, and the Democrats only won three seats as well. So now we get to the question of whether or not move forward having won the election and now having the most MPs will actually be able to form a government or will they face the same issue as they as put did at the last election where they weren't able to form a coalition. As we discussed earlier, the, the 2017 constitution has a provision where the Senate entirely appointed by the military during the uh, during military rule has 250 seats and they're able to participate in the selection of the prime minister. So although there are 500 House MPs and you, you, need, a, you need 250 MPs in order to have a stable uh, governing majority, you actually need 376 seats total in parliament to become prime minister when combined with the 250 Senate seats. So what Pita, the leader of the Move Forward Party has done is that he's a, he has cobbled together a large coalition that in a normal democracy would have no problem setting up a government. So Move Forward has 150 seats, Pita has 140 seats, and a number of other coalition parties has around 20 seats. So he has about 312 MPs, give or take, while the non-coalition parties only have 188 seats. However, he still needs to get to that magic number of 376. And at this point, it's still unclear where he's going to get those seats. About 20 senators have said that they're willing to vote for Pita, but the vast majority have been silent, while a sizable number have already come out and said that due to the Move Forward Party stance, on amending the Less Than Jeste Law, which criminalizes uh, criticism of the monarchy. They're unable to vote for Pita and they won't support move forward in forming a government. It's also evident that the non coalition parties probably are not going to help Pita and vote for him. There was a smaller conservative party that Pita tried to pull into the coalition, but then there was massive backlash against that and they had and they were rejected. And so it seems that Pita has hit his ceiling on the number of uh, lower house MPs that he can get. What's entirely possible is that if Pita doesn't get to that uh, to that magic number and uh, he's unable to form a government, another party such as Pua Thai might then try to make a go at setting up a government instead and move forward despite winning the election might end up in opposition. So I think that ends our quick primer of the uh, 2023 election and the events that transpired. Let's begin by constructing some probabilities and some improbabilities. Take, for example, the, the possibility that Pata could not manage to put together the necessary votes, uh, then would that mean that perhaps uh, the Puttai party, if you, that's how, I'm not quite sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, the Fiu party, the party of the, of the, uh, of the Shinawats, would that mean that, that there would then be a relatively high probability that uh, that party and Patonkan in particular would then become prime minister. Or at that point, perhaps the military would become so worried uh, that it might take steps to basically prevent the process from unfolding. Something that I didn't mention uh, before was that in the lead up, in the run up to this election, there had been a lot of rumors that Kutai was actually going to try to form a coalition with General Pravit and Palam Prashart after the election. It would have been a surprising, you know, cross cross camp coalition that uh, would have what what that would have crossed ideological boundaries. But uh, Kuwaiti had was quite slow to dismiss these rumors, so a lot of people now seem to imagine that there was some truth to 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 these rumors as well. And if Move Forward is unable to form a coalition, I think that it would be entirely possible that Puatai would then try to uh, reach across the aisle to the key uh, conservative parties, such as Poon Tai Tai and Palam Pachar, to then perhaps try to form a government. And in this instance, the resistance from the military or from the conservative establishment might be lower because A, uh, Barit was actually the, the chairman of the committee that appointed the senators. So he's able to you know, twist arms, get the senators to vote for the, the candidate of his preference, and if Barit has expressed his parents as Puyatai, then I think a number of senators, perhaps enough to get up, get Palantar elected as prime minister, will follow. The uh, the second possibility is that Puyatai allows a non-Puyatai uh, prime minister to then to then take power as a kind of compromise candidate, 
someone that can more easily sail through the Senate than a Shinawat. And so I think that's one route to reducing resistance. Yeah, and I just add, um, the math works really, really nicely for Puyatai. Um, Puyatai, uh, Pumjai Thai, Palam Prasarak coalition comes in at 252, um, roughly, uh, you know, with some, some seats still, still undecided. But um, uh, so it gives the majority in the House and I think uh, with Prawit uh, at, at the helm, either behind the scenes or as the prime ministerial candidate uh, that sails through the Senate um, uh, and uh, um, you know, brings us back to another Puyatai led government uh, uh, for the next, uh, at least for the next couple of years. Would you be willing, uh, you know, we're recording this uh, conversation, so I don't want to trap you into a prediction that turns out not to be correct, but and I'm not pushing you uh, in the direction of futurology, don't misunderstand. Nevertheless, um, the scenario you've just outlined, which is really quite quite fascinating to me, would it be the case that that scenario, if it were to take place, would then allow the military, the leadership of the military, whether it's Prawit or Prayut, to accept it? And that we would then have a move in a kind of Shinawat you know, at least generationally, a Shinawat direction without, you know, a coup, without repression, without violence. Yeah. So I, I think if 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 there's a path that 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 gets us through this without um more serious um intervention by the military, that's probably the path, or 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 the dissolution of other parties, that's probably the path. Um, you know, the enemy of my, of my enemy is my friend, and, and I, I think it's pretty clear that the military and the conservative forces see move forward as a bigger threat right now um, than, uh, than Puyatai. They're the, the um, uh, certainly policy-wise, that's the case. Um, the main challenge is just the personal animus with, with Taksin. Um, but I think, uh, I think it's, you know I, that if, if I was going to put my money on an outcome, that's the outcome that that I would I, you know I would think is most likely. Whether um, whether they take steps beyond that to uh, to uh, ban Pita from politics, there's an outstanding case against him to dissolve, move forward. Those are really open questions, and I think the the more aggressive they are in that direction, the more likely it is that we have. Uh, protests and un unrest in response to that kind of stuff. Even even a even a within constitutional um, uh, government uh, formation headed by Puyatai, even if that happens, um, I, I would just ex expect some protests by uh, by move forward uh, supporters. If something along those lines, uh, you know, I, I, I emphasize that, you know, we're, I'm not trying to uh, generate a kind of step by step prediction here because uh, uh, there are just too many unknowns. But if something along those lines, a kind of Shinawat uh, outcome, if I can put it that way, occurs, what do you think would happen to the desire on the part of a number of people in the younger generation in Thailand uh, to remove the Les Majeste uh, restrictions? Do you think that that is a third rail that would be avoided necessarily in order to have a peaceful transition to power, at least on the part of uh, the Democrats, so to speak? I think that a desire for, you know, the desire of the younger generation for deeper structural change runs deep. And I don't think that, you know, having a Thai government that excludes move forward will be able to play those demands. I, I think it's become very clear that Thai has very several different policy priorities and move forward. They, they're still at some points, they've come out against a uh, less than just amendment. At some points, they've seemed more open to it. But I, but but the rumors that they in the coalition agreement that they tried that they made it move forward, they they got uh, less than just excluded. And so I think that a put led government that excludes move forward would not try, would not touch, you know, would, would not touch the monarchy, would not touch these deeper deeper structural reforms that uh, move forward wants. And and so I think the. Uh, the younger generation would be entirely dissatisfied. And in fact, I think it sets up the, the ground for a move forward landslide at the next election if, if move forward is excluded. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. I think uh, you, you mentioned that, that this was a surprising result, um, the move forward uh, victory, if you, we can quote unquote victory. Well, as political scientists, looking back, what one what would one have to have known in order not to be surprised by the move forward 
I, I'll completely confess here, and this 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 I guess tells you you probably should discount um, anything I say going forward. Um, so I thought that that it move forward at best could get about eighty seats, right? Um, that was that was its 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 sort of cap, um, and that that was based on sort of two things. So one, uh, the new election rules. Uh, really limited the kind of the bang for your buck you could get out of the party list. Um, so really uh, capped what, what the party could get there. Uh, and then Move Forward had not done very well in building a sort of locally based machine, which has traditionally been one of the, you know, an important, important part of a party's mobilization strategy. So having so a local a local network that can mobilize on your behalf at the ground level. And in the I run in the in the local elections, the elections for uh, for mayors, for uh, for provincial councils, um, uh, for um, Tambon councils uh, in the last couple of years, move forward on very poorly in those elections. Um, uh, had not been a, and and which was a sort of indication that they really didn't have the sort of locally based political network that um, generally you need to win those constituency seats. So I suspected that um, I, I, my guess was that the move forward would do really well on the party list. That was very clear. They had the most uh, the most momentum. Uh, voters were you know, that's who people were talking about and people were excited about. But that sort of traditional machinery. Uh, would uh, would play out in the constituency seats and move forward would, would win very few seats outside of uh, the capital and a few uh, outside Bangkok and a few provincial capitals. And what I had failed to anticipate it was just how wide and deep the sort of uh, repudiation of the last nine years uh, was among uh, among many voters, not just young voters, but how dissatisfied folks were, um, uh, and that dis dissatisfaction overwhelmed. The sort of traditional ties they might have to local machines who they voted for in the past and may may vote for again, and I think uh, um, we would have uh, we got a sense of this as election drew drew closer. We we needed to understand how dissatisfied people were with Puyatai's flirtation uh, with Palam Prachara. So that that turned a lot of voters away who I think might have otherwise uh, voted for Puyatai, um, uh, had them consider move forward because it looked like Puyatai was willing to enter a coalition with. Uh, um, the former coup leaders. Um, so that th those are sort of two things I think we underestimated, at least I underestimated. I wonder if also, I mean, insofar as uh, the, the the leadership, uh, you know, uh, Pitta, after all, I mean, the, <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's got a Harvard degree. In other words, if I transpose, uh, which is completely unfair, uh, situations from other countries, uh, including, for example, the United States, one would have thought that that other things being equal, which clearly they were not in Thailand, in the rural areas, uh, there might have been opposition to uh, to him and to his party simply because these are Western educated elites, and we in you know the Isan area and the in the in the rural in the boondocks, so to speak, in Thailand, you know we have urgent needs, right? And 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 we're not wealthy, and we don't have degrees from Western universities and so forth, and that would have been then a source of uh, of resentment. I'm glad you put the maps up, and I wonder if you could use geography a little bit as the independent variable. And uh, let let me know what that looks like in terms of explanation. Yeah, so I mean, I I think that as Alan discussed, we underestimated the degree to which we would see a uh, urban rural convergence at this election. There used to be, you know, the, the classic theory of Thai politics that Thailand is a tale of two democracies, right, where rural voters vote for quote unquote, corrupt uh, patronage driven uh, parties and politicians that are then overthrown by the more policy driven uh, urban voters. But what became clear this time around is that urban and rural voters actually, in some ways, converge. And there was a search for a move forward, you know, that was uniform in across Thailand. And the other thing is that as as you mentioned, you might have expected that Pita would have been able to do quite as well. Because the the precursor to, you know, the Western educated uh elite elitist politician was opposite of the Democrat Party. And the Democrats never won a single election while uh in the past 20 years. In fact the Democrats haven't won a single election since uh, 1992. And the fact that Pita was actually able to pull this off means that I think the party appeal had superseded his own appeal as a leader in many ways, I think. Mm -hmm. And speaking of geography, I think what's really striking looking at this map is the extent to which Move Forward was able to penetrate 
essentially all regions of uh, of Thailand at this election. So if you look at the 2019 map, so red is the Pure Thai Party, and various shades of blue are the various conservative parties. It was clear that in 2019, uh, Thaksin's base had held in the north and northeast his traditional basis of power, while the, the Democrats, they lost all the seats, but they they were still dominant in the south. Uh, Plum Shah and Poon Jai Thai took the lion's share of the vote in the central region and in the east. Well, Move Forward had won very few, uh, Future Forward in 2019 had won very few constituencies. It was clear in 2023 that things have changed. Even in uh, Thaksin's hometown of Chiang Mai in the north, Move Forward had swept. Uh, in the northeast, Pua Thai's hold had finally cracked. In Bangkok, Move Forward had swept 32 out of 33 seats. And even in the south, where uh, Thaksin had had a very hard time winning any seats, uh, Move Forward actually won a number of constituency seats on, uh, in, for example, in the island of Phuket. So it was clear that, you know, the uh, Move Forward appeal was nationwide, not just confined to a number of regions. And also, I think that it, using this map to, again, illustrate the part of this vote and constituency vote, the uh, constituencies might show that there, there was a diversity of parties that people were voting for. But the part of this shows that Move Forward actually swept essentially nationwide again. And in fact, while we were doing field work in, in, in Northern Thailand, we were interviewing voters and voters told Anna and I that although they were voting for Palang Prashar on, uh, on the constituency ballot, they were actually going to, because they liked a local MP, they were going to vote for Move Forward on the party list. So it was clear that there was a, even when people like their local MP from a conservative party, they still wanted to express this anti youth sentiment, this desire for change through the party list vote. And that was why Move Forward uh, did so well. And again, this final map showing uh, the future forward vote in 2019 and move forward vote. There was a big surge, again, nationwide across, across the country that I think that most observers have failed to anticipate. We thought move forward would do well, but not quite this well. Would it be fair then to shift from geography and perhaps also from the kind of urban rural uh, distinction and start talking generationally? In other words, mm -hmm. insofar as uh, you, you know the 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 newcomers, so to speak, uh, were younger, and maybe I'm exaggerating on the basis of the leadership, which is of course relatively young, that this was really a generational change. So I I think that that that's the catalyst, but I think this you don't get numbers like this with just younger voters voting. So um, right. so the the sort of leading. Uh, so I mean, we talked to candidates, right, from from a variety of parties. So they would all mention uh, um, the the move forward, the the sort of momentum, the uh, the momentum that, that the party had, um, and uh, they would say things like, "Anybody younger than thirty, we're just writing off, right? We know they're not going to support us." But they but they were really worried about the forty, the the people forty, fifty, sixty uh, um, uh, that they were going to lose those voters. In fact, one of the reasons that some parties told us they were pushing early voting. Uh, was to try and get parents and grandparents to the polls before their kids came home to vote uh, because they worried the kids would sway the, the, the parents. So the, these numbers suggest that uh, certainly the youth vote was powerful and the momentum uh, uh, that created a momentum. But these this this suggests that it wasn't just 20, uh, you know, 20 to 30 year olds that were that were driving this. Uh, this was uh, this is a wide scale repudiation of the last nine years. Uh, that that cuts across, I think, uh, demographics. Now, certainly, the, the older we go, the less likely people are, and we're we're you know we're looking at these data now. But um, uh, the polling suggests that older voters were less likely to support move forward, to move forward, more likely to support Palang uh, Pracharat or Rum Thai Sang Chat. Um, but uh, but but move forward got a lot of support from uh, middle age and older voters as well. Ken, I don't know if you want to to add or correct any of that. Yeah, I mean, I. I, what we did here also in field work was that there were a lot of younger people who went back home and convinced their parents and their grandparents to vote for, to vote for move forward. They said, you know, for, for the sake of my future, please do this. And I think that's quite a shift from in the past when, you know, younger people are expected to listen to older people, not, not the other way around. And speaking of the United Thai Nation, I think that it's worth looking a little bit at, at how they they really underperformed even in places where we expected them to perform well. So the southern region had always been, you know, the uh, the most conservative. They consistently voting for the Democrats. 
And so I think United Thai Nation here is, is dark blue in 2023 map. And even in the South where Bayut had, you know, campaigned intensely and where they did manage to win some win over some seats, they still didn't do uh, quite as well. And so I think that it, that suggests that even among, you know, older conservative voters, there just wasn't enough of them that turned out or enough of them that, that you know, wanted in a continuation of Bayut's role to come out and lead them to gain anything remotely close to an election victory. So um, I, I think that in all respects, the United Thai Nation Party underperformed. So I think there is, uh, Donna, uh, uh, there is a generational uh, cleavage, but I think what this these results suggest is that what's been brewing for a decade or more now is this is this sort of pro anti reform uh, or you know conservative progressive uh, cleavage that has ensconced itself in Thailand, um, and um, that cuts across age. A uh, lot uh, we heard the, the phrase "bua <laughs> prayut" from 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 lots of different candidates, even. Uh, even candidates for, for you know from his own party, um, uh, you know as as, as expressing that sorry, I mean, I'm bored with Prayut, we're we're done with Prayut, right? So lots of people who were um, uh, who, who were just ready for change, even those who may have voted for Panambasha at the last election. Um, this this election was really a sort of a, a, a referendum on the last nine years. Uh, were you did you want more of this, or were you ready for a change? And um, and I think lots of people, uh, the results suggest, were ready for some sort of change and were willing uh, to vote for the party that, was the, that, that sent the clearest and consistent signal that they would change uh, the way that the way the Thai policy has been done for the last 20 years. I guess in your conversations uh, on the ground, uh, since you were there, um, the last nine years, uh, that covers a lot of content. And I'm wondering, I mean, were there complaints that were focused primarily on the economy, for instance, um, on other issues? To say that they were tired of nine years, yes, uh, that makes sense. But why? I think that we heard a lot about economic issues because Thailand was hit hard during the COVID lockdown, being uh, mainly dependent on tourism and then going through the uh, going through close borders for almost two years. And in some ways, you know, that was out of Bruce's control. Nothing much he could have done about, you know, the COVID economy. And he did try his best to stimulate the economy through various, you know, cash stimulus programs. But in the end, I think that wasn't enough to head off the uh, anti brute sentiment. I think another aspect was also simply personality. Brute's a mercurial, you know, gruff general, very, uh, not, not a great temper. And something that we did hear on the ground was that people... They they wanted you know a new leader who was you know b better spoken. They they thought that his time was up, and I think that a third aspect is again the 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 zero of structural change because the uh, the protests in twenty twenty had gone where no previous protests had gone before. They had you know touched on many of the deeper you know conservative institutions that previous protests previous politicians would not have mentioned, and I think that this led a new um. A new sentiment in Thailand that they that many people wanted to uh, move forward and see something different, and it was something that Bayut was unable to answer. So in the in the week leading up to the election, the United Thai Nation Party launched an ad that was aimed squarely at move forward. They asked whether or not Thai Thais really wanted change. They hinted that you know the move forward would abolish the army, would get rid of religion, would change how Thailand's family and social structures are run. And it was clear that, you know, this was an attempt to try to hold on to the base, to try to convince people that Thailand doesn't want change in that direction. But in the end, you know, A, it was over to the top. And so people didn't believe it because the the video what didn't actually communicate what Move Forward was talking about. And secondly, I think in the end, holding on to the base was not enough. The United Thai Nation won 4 million votes, but the desire for change went much further beyond that. Just a, a technical point, because the uh, the maps that we're looking at don't have identifications as to the colors. Could you just briefly explain, in the case of the 2023 election, you know, explain the blue versus the red and maybe the yellow as well? Yeah. So the um, so the the red is uh, Puatai. Uh, so uh, uh, stronghold in the north and northeast that's just fractured mm -hmm. in 2023. The yellow is uh, move forward. Um, the uh, sort of you see the center the um, 
uh, kind of the, the, the um, there's uh, Boom Jai Tai is the darker blue and the um, and the kind of steel blue, I guess, uh, is um, uh, Boom Jai Tai. Uh, sorry, the, that's the other way around. The, the Boom, Boom Jai Tai is the uh, is the uh, royal blue. The steel blue is uh, um, Panam Prachara. And then uh, as you go down south, uh, you'll see it's, it's hard to see in the, on this the construct in this map, but the sort of darker blue as you go down the neck of the south. Uh, is uh, Rum Tai Sang Chat. So in the South, we have Rum Tai Sang Chat, Boom Jai Tai, Pum Jai Tai, and, um, and the Democrats really holding, uh, holding court in the South. Ken, did, did I get that right? At least on my map, I think that's what it looks like. So Rum Tai Sang Chat is the Thai name for United Thai Nation Party, Party. Yes, right. sorry. Yes. Okay, right, right, good, that's helpful. Well, it, let, let me um, shift uh, gears a little bit. The 23 point um, memorandum of understanding that came out of the coalition. Uh, it may be irrelevant, the coalition may be irrelevant and so forth. Nevertheless, it gives us an indication of what the concerns are, uh, at least some of them. When you looked at that listing, were there certain items that stood out that were more interesting than others or more surprising than others? Well, the thing that struck me is how quickly they so you can imagine after the election, one reaction would be, okay, let's let's become a little more conservative. Let's try and we want to we want to try and get power. Let's let's back off some of our um, uh, let, let's let's water down at least uh, at least rhetorically some of the some of the the language we've been using in the election. Instead, it was a pretty bold move to say, here's what we here's what we believe. Here's what we stand for: um, uh, military reform. Uh, we're going to tackle one one two. Right? It was uh, you know it, it was a pretty bold statement right from the beginning, saying, here's what our government's going to look like. Um, uh, Excuse it, me for interrupting. Wait a minute. One one two. The the that's the less majesty. Uh, I want to make sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, so. Uh, um, uh, again, uh, shockingly bold uh, in Thai politics, where you know the. Uh, um, uh, no permanent enemies, no permanent friends has sort of been the, the standard for many parties. Um, uh, uh, and uh, um, clearly laid out its agenda. Uh, now, in forming the coalition, it's had to leave some of those things off. Uh, um, let's not just say reform uh, is if, if, the, if, put, if uh, move forward takes power, will be, will be if, it's, if it's put forward, we put forward just by the party, not by the coalition. They had to take that out of. Uh, the coalition M MOU, but uh, a lot of those thirty-nine, those 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 those, those twenty-nine points have been ha have have made it into that memorandum. Ken, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I'm going to add a tangent. The uh, the MOU included a uh, re recriminalization of marijuana. So as we talked about, the Punjab Thai Party, the third biggest party in, in from from this election, had in 2019 campaigned on legalizing marijuana for medical purposes. This time around, a uh, they had said that they would, if they got back into the government, they would now try to push to regulate it. So not because right now in Thailand it's kind of a free for all. If anybody's been in Thailand recently, you've seen a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, marijuana dispensaries just popping up all over, all over the city. Something you wouldn't have expected in in Thailand in the past. And so the fact that the the new coalition has said that they would recriminalize marijuana, I think, is a clear attempt to try to you know push back at Pumjai Thai and their success in winning constituencies this time around. I think I would speak a little bit about the fact that there was an MOU at all, because this is a new innovation in Thai politics, right? In in the past, uh, coalition dealing has always been about, you know, so-called dividing the cake. You take, you know, the, uh, the, the the nice ministries, I'll take these ministries, and then, and then that's how coalitions are formed. At this point in time, we still haven't heard anything uh, concrete about who's, which party is going to take which post it's all been it's all been about policy. It's all been about you know which what's our shared standpoint. So I think that's a that's a promising new change in Thai politics. But the flip side is that it also leaves the coalition vulnerable to collapse at a later point in time when you do have to divide the cake. And already we're seeing Pua Thai move forward squabble over the House Speaker seat. Move forward say they need that seat to push push through their priorities, especially the ones that didn't make it into the MOU. For example, amending the Lesson Jeste law. Well, Puatai said that they almost had the same number of seats to move forward, move forward, so we're going to take the prime ministerial role. So why can't they then take uh, the, the speakership? And I think that this, we'll have to see how, how things go. Yeah, right. It is, I think, yeah, I, I, it is somewhat surprising, but also actually encouraging 
I mean, the, the image of political parties in Southeast Asia, forgive me for making a gross generalization, but in many of the region's countries, it seems to me, um, they, 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 they boil down to kind of, you know, patron-client relations and programmatic political parties that are actually say, this is the policy we want, this is the policy we don't want. You know, they're, rel I mean, I'm generalizing admittedly, but, and there are exceptions, but they're relatively rare. And it would be nice if this were an indication, of course, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, um, who will end up ruling uh, Thailand in a sense, uh, but it's, it's, it's an encouraging indication. And I, I wanted to raise one particular item in that, um, uh, in that document, in the Memorandum of Understanding, simply because it's of interest to me and probably to both of you as well, which is not a matter of domestic politics or domestic economics but is rather foreign policy. And I'm quoting from the Memorandum of Understanding that uh, Thailand should, or the idea is to restore, quote unquote, restore Thailand's leadership role in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in ASEAN. Um, I'm not sure if you have any comments to make. Perhaps, I'm not saying that was an issue. Well, maybe it was. Uh, is this just C can you put this in some kind of context, why it's there? I think that there's a general perception that under, in the nine years of the British administration, China has been distracted by, you know, domestic affairs. It hasn't played the traditional regional leadership role that it has in years past. And I, I think that a, a good way to conceptualize it is that Pita sees Thailand as a middle power that can take on a regional leadership role and can push for you know, rules-based diplom diplomacy that we didn't really see under Brigitte. And so I think that's why he's been quite clear in putting foreign policy, you know, and saying he's going to be a foreign policy prime minister. He's, uh, and move forward to policy stances in the past have differentiated it from other parties. There were Volko in Myanmar in ways that other parties were not. There were Volko in Ukraine in ways that other parties were not as well. And to... On the question of whether or not foreign policy was an election issue, I don't think that it uh, figured prominently in debates or in policy priorities, but there was an undercurrent where conservatives would argue that Pita's more confrontational stance, more values-based diplomacy would mean that would leave Thailand at the mercy of great powers. It would, you know, push Thailand more towards the American camp and alienate China. It would make Thailand more vulnerable. And I think that Although it didn't really, you know, come come on the debate stage right now that Pita is saying these things, I do see a lot of conservatives come out coming out to oppose Pita's uh, foreign policy stances. So, uh, yeah. So yeah. part of it is one thing to watch is who who is his foreign policy team. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that that'll be an important signal. Um, uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of rumors flying right now about who that could be, but uh, they'll want someone who. Who can reassure those who worry about the, somebody who wouldn't have the gravitas at the international stage? But they clearly, consistent with the sort of parties, sort of progressive, pro-democratic uh, framework, they've they want to apply that to um, uh, you know to foreign policy and and you know were they to take power, you'd expect changes to their on the policy towards Myanmar and also uh, Ukraine, um, as, as Ken mentioned. Don, I want to just back up really quickly and just 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 uh, say something about you. You mentioned the sort of innovation in in sort of in, in party development that, that, that move forward represents and I agree with that I just want to know though that for for two decades Puatai's occupied that position right uh, it was the it was the sort of first Thai party to really put policy front and center um, uh, but it was not reform it was development right it was we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna 30 bot healthcare scheme uh, debt relief programs um, it was uh, party the party campaigned on policies uh, uh, sometimes called populist policies but, but programmatic policies that it then it delivered on uh, the problem was that wasn't innovation anymore it continued to do that all of the parties had adopted basically those same policies and the differences were in the title of the policies and the exact amount that people were going to be getting uh, that no longer differentiated put a tie from its competitors and uh, and so the next iteration of party innovation uh, is is move forward right not we don't want just policy, we want structural change, right? And that's really what set them apart from the sort of earlier version of innovation that that that, that, that Puyatai represented, in my view. I would also add that this time around, Puyatai, I think, finally went too far. They went over the top with their, you know, populist policy pledges. Uh, their, their key pledge this time around was that they would give 10,000 baht 
to every single person above the age of 16 in Thailand. But they said that they would give this in essentially digital money, some sort of cryptocurrency that would be issued by the Bank of Thailand, and that they, this could be spent only in a four kilometer radius around their, ho around their home. I think that this led to several questions about what this cryptocurrency would look like, about how they were going to do this without setting inflation, you know, skyrocketing, how they were going to uh, fund this without impacting all the other policy pledges that they had also made that would cost you know, massive amounts of money. And in the end, I think it led to a general sense of disbelief that Pua Thai could actually pull this off or that it was fiscally responsible. So in some ways, I think Pua Thai had exhausted their playbook and it's the, the populism can only go so far. I think it's time to dip into the questions from the audience, uh, if that's okay. Uh, in reference to the ITV case, the ITV case, and the question is, will Pata survive the constitutional court ruling in the ITV case? And you could perhaps explain what the ITV case is. So the ITV case is, uh, there's a clause in time selection laws that a candidate for a member for, for parliament or for prime minister cannot hold chairs in a media company. And so ITV is a defunct media company, no longer operational, but Pita, I think, had inherited those chairs and still technically owns them. Pita's argument is that he doesn't really own them, that it's in some sort of trust fund and that uh, it's, and that the media company isn't even functional, isn't even operating anymore, so that he, legally he should be in the clear. But there's been a legal case that's been filed with with the uh, Electoral Commission that Pita should be disqualified because, because of this case. And uh, if Pita is disqualified, it would lead to a number of ramifications. One being move forward only nominated one candidate for prime minister, Pita. And according to the constitution, you can't nominate people outside of the, the candidate bank that uh, parties have submitted. And so if Pita is disqualified, move forward doesn't have an alternative uh, uh, candidate to fall back on. Secondly, according to move forward's own party rules, there's, they regulate that their party leadership is not allowed to hold media shares as well. And so if Pita is disqualified, there's a legal argument that because he signed papers certifying all the candidates running in every single constituency uh, nationwide from move forward, if Pita wasn't actually eligible to be party leader due to the media shares case, none of the uh, candidates running or act were actually qualified to run because Pita had signed off on them and he was supposed to do that. The Deputy Prime Minister of Legal Affairs has said that it might actually lead to a whole new election where t all elections, all the, all the constituencies have to be rerun to make up for all the move forward candidates being disqualified. That would be quite a drastic move. I'm not sure they would go so far, but that's where we stand right now. So, so my, I, I can get a great summary there. I kind of view the, the case as the breaking case of emergency uh, button, right? The, the, that's there if, if nothing else it works. Um, uh, I, I do think they're wary to use that uh, uh, given what happened in 2020 when they uh, dissolved uh, Future Forward and banned uh, Tanaton. Um, th that would certainly trigger protests. And so I think there's uh, my my read is there's a preference to try and maneuver things uh, to to have another government that's not headed government not headed by Pita without having to take this step, but it's there as both a, a, a threat, uh, but as a sort of um, uh, you know emergency lever in case they need it. Here's a question uh, and a comment from Tyler Chen, who's a guest. You'll be pleased to know that he says, thanks for the wonderful talk, exclamation point. So you're doing well. <laughs> and he goes on to say, I'm wondering why some senators appointed by the military intend to vote for a move forward led coalition. For instance, are there any exchanges of benefits behind this? I think he means, you know, transfers of funds or something like that. Are they putting up a political show? So um, there's certainly um, lots of maneuvering going on behind the scenes and attempts to, uh, by Move Forward, to woo uh, senators. Move Forward doesn't have a lot of weapons in its arsenal on that uh, on, on that score, unfortunately, uh, both because of its reputation and the kinds of policies it's it's pledged to support. Um, it just has it gets its limited traction, but it also doesn't have the same kind uh, of sort of entrenched networks and relationships. 
that say a patai has. Um, uh, so my read is it's um, that I, I would expect more of that wheeling and dealing from Puatai, um, and I don't think Puatai is wheeling and dealing on behalf of Move Forward uh, in this case. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. Is it possible to keep the military from controlling the country in the future? Well, this is a very broad question. I think to some extent, the conversation so far has at least, well, anyway, I'll just leave it as it is. Do you think it's possible for the military to uh, control the future? And is it possible to prevent that from happening? So I think there's definitely a higher cost now to an overt military intervention than in the past. I think that we shouldn't remember, that we, we shouldn't forget that the military coup against Toxin built in 2006 and 2014 were not unpopular across, you know, all segments of the population. There were people who had welcomed the military's intervention in order to restore peace. There were people who had wanted the military to put an end to what they saw as toxins, corruption. There were people who simply didn't think democracy was a viable political system for Thailand. And they thought, you know, a guided democracy or a semi authoritarian system would work better. I think that there's been a bigger shift in, in attitudes in the past few years. Uh, the younger generation are almost uniformly against military rule and military intervention in politics. And I, I, at this point, there's still no uh, clear justification or rationale behind putting on another military coup, especially so early in the political cycle where the election is just concluded. So I think that in the short term, we're probably not going to see, you know, a coup or a military return to politics quite yet. It's harder to say for the medium and long term. I imagine that in 1992, after Black May, when you know the military was essentially sent back to the barracks, a lot of people also thought back then that the military wasn't going to come back, and then here they and, and then they they came back in force in 2006. So it's hard to say, you know, with certainty what's going to happen in the long term. Good. Here's a question from a colleague of mine, Tom Finger: If the military affiliated parties block move forward, will people take to the streets? Is there any role for the monarchy in shaping or gaining acceptance of the next government? So actually, there are two questions. The um, I think if if move forward is uh, banned or Pita is convicted, I think almost certainly there's protests uh, and and pretty pretty big protests. Uh, if if the if if they fail to form the government, I think we still get protests, but probably uh, uh, not on the same scale as we do if 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 the government overtly moves against uh, um, uh, uh, on move forward. The, uh, the the role of the monarchy. So just one one interesting thing on that. Um, yeah, I mean you can imagine you can imagine a scenario where um, the king is vocal about which government he will support um, uh, on you know uh, on either side, uh, and that would certainly hold some sway. What is notable about this election uh, is that unlike 2019, where the king on two occasions played a very direct role, uh, a very public and direct role in uh, in the election, first in uh, condemning and setting up the banning of um, or the, the the rejection of his his sister as a as a candidate and the eventual dissolution of uh, another uh, toxin affiliated party, um, and then uh, the eve of the election urging voters to vote for good people, right? Which is which everybody understood as code for um, uh, conservative uh, conservative candidates and parties. The the monarchy was silent in this election. So no, uh, you know, no public statements, no, um, just just you know, radio silence from the uh, from the monarchy. So, uh, you know, I, we, we, nobody knows what's going on behind the curtains there. Uh, but you could imagine the, the, the if the king wanted to, he could play a role here, right? I, either as a as a complicator or as a or as a bridge builder, peacemaker. But so far, there's been no indication that that the monarchy is willing to play that role, uh, at least that I've that I've seen or heard. Here's a slightly more technical uh, question from Eric White. Most commentary, he writes, most commentary focuses on the number of constituency and party list seats won by the various parties. But what about the raw number of total votes in terms of either list, nationally or regionally? Were Move Forward and Pattai, for example, more or less equally matched in terms of numbers of votes? That's a that's a good question. Maybe I can speak to that. So on the for uh, the the party list move forward dominates. So it gets about fourteen point five million votes to put to put a tie is almost eleven million. Uh, so about three point five million more. They're much closer at the constituency level. This was the shocker. So move move forward wins at the constituency vote 
uh, account as well, they get about a 9.6 million uh, to put a tie is 9.3 million. So all the total, if you sort of look at all votes nationwide cast, put a tie, I uh, sorry, uh, move forward sitting at about 24 million uh, to put a tie is 20 million. So it's a pretty you know, close, but a pretty, but but a pretty good, a pretty good trouncing by move forward uh, of put a tie across the board. Um, we can and we can break it down by region areas where put a tie did a bit better, pay uh, places where move forward did a bit better. Uh, but um, uh, but in terms of votes, uh, um, move forward had a pretty convincing victory across the board. This question asks: uh, Were people voting for policies or voting against the status quo? To which I suppose the answer could be both. But I'm but I'm I'm not as you know I'm asking you. In my mind, so I don't, I don't think the differentiator was anybody's economic policies, because, because again, most folks at the end of the day had similar bundles of policies and it was hard to differentiate them. I, I think that a rejection of the status quo was an affirmative statement. Well, so there are, there are voters who are just sick of the military and just want, and just want to change or really, really vote for change. But I think most people voting for Move Forward were voting for the structural reforms the party was uh, was calling for. So um, uh, this, this was an affirmative vote for rethinking of the way the military, military's role in politics, uh, for rethinking the use of um, punitive measures against the opposition of a, a variety of forms, right? So I, I, I think a lot of that vote represents some desire for positive change, not just a vote against the military. Um, there's certainly some of that, um, but I think there's, um, uh, uh, you know, again, if it was just we don't we want to vote against the military, um, uh, you know, put a tie picks up more votes, right? It was we are um, we we want clear change and this and and move forward represented the clearest path uh, to to structural change. On foreign policy, uh, assuming a new government, is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs post? Uh, likely to go to an MFP fig uh, figure or or not? And how important are members of the Milk Tea Alliance to the Move Forward Party's base? I think that it's hard to say right now who the foreign ministry portfolio will go to. There were media rumors that uh, Puyatai would take this post and actually Hathan Ta and Thaksin's daughter was actually going to fill this show herself. But I see that as unlikely. I don't think that position, which, you know, unlike the U.S. Secretary of State, the the Foreign Affairs Ministry isn't really something that's coveted by the parties. So I don't I don't really see it as something that, you know, Thaksin would be dying to to take, especially for his own daughter. Uh, it's possible that I think move forward might take it, given the the importance that they place themselves on uh, on foreign policy. They they have a they've, they've already assembled a foreign policy team. For example, uh, Pita's key foreign policy advisor is Kun Swari Pitsuman, who is the son of uh, Sir Pitsuman, the former ASEAN Secretary Gen uh, General and uh, former foreign minister. So I I think that they have some talent that they can that they can draw from. On the question of the Mukti Alliance, I back during the process it was something that uh that people did talk about the, uh, the the common connections between you know protesters in thailand and across asia i think i don't think that it played quite the same level of uh it was getting quite the same level of attention during the election itself this one is from nuno caldera da, Sal da silva uh as i am speaking from chiang mai i would say good morning <laughs> i and he explains who he is. He's a professor of political science at Chiang Mai University. Having in mind the possibility of a Putai lead government, if they align with the conservative forces, he has two questions. First, will that be in the mid to long term the end of Putai? Second, how will Putai deal with the likely need to open up the prime minister position to Prawit? I can't see Taksin's daughter or even others being accepted as a prime minister by Prawit. Um, maybe I'll speak to the first one, Ken, if you want to take the second one. Um, uh, so would this, end, would this be the end of the, the midterm long end, uh, mid midterm to, to long-term end of Putai? I, I, I think that um, if Putai enters that coalition, it certainly gives up the reformist card um, uh, and gives, gives, it's already given some ground to that to move forward. I think that sort of seals the deal. 
um, uh, in, in some ways in terms of move forward's political future, being in the opposition with Puatai in power is probably the best recipe for move forward victory the next election. Um, Puatai is gonna have to compromise and, and is, is unlikely to push uh, for the structural reforms uh, that move forward uh, uh, has promised. Um, so I, I would suspect, you know, again, lots can happen in, in one, two, four years, whenever the next election is gonna happen. But I would expect if, if, if that kind of coalition forms that, uh, that Puyatai's vote share declines next election uh, and move forwards uh, goes up. That'd be my, my, you know, my prediction. Yeah, I, I would add just that from Tox's perspective, I'm not sure whether or not he entirely cares what happens to put that in the next election. His party right now is coming home. He's been in self-exile for, you know, a decade and a half. He's he's tweeted several times in the lead up to the election that he's got he's going to come home no matter what, even if that means going to jail. I um I, I'll take that with a grain of salt, but the fact that he 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 badly wants to make a deal with the conservatives that would allow him to come home, I think, is the priority for him. And but whether or not put like fares you know, well at the next election might not be super material to him. The, the other part is I definitely agree with Alan that a spell in opposition would probably do wonders to move forward popularity heading to the next election. And in fact, being in government might actually mean they suffer losses next time. Already, they're already having to face with, you know, the realities of, of government, of having to compromise, of being able to, you know, set themselves up as a peer opposition party. They, uh, they've been com coming under fierce criticism for nominating Kun Firikanya uh, Tantsukun a relatively inexperienced economic figure for the Ministry of Finance, and it's already sent the stock market, you know, tanking in the past few days. So I think that there's definitely a lot of a lot of potential blowback that happens if move forward is in government, but with a small majority and is unable to push forward their policy priorities, and if their inexperience in government begins to show, because they really they didn't prepare to be in government this time. They didn't think they were going to win, and on the the second question on um, whether or not Kuwaitai is going to open up the prime minister position for a bit, I don't think it's clear at this stage uh, if Kuwaitai does uh, break the promise to support move forward and then try to form an interpretive coalition, who the prime minister will be. They have uh, three prime minister candidates, Pat Tong Tan and then Kun Se Ta Tui Sin, who's a property tycoon. I think that he could probably be more acceptable to uh to the establishment because he, simply because he's on a Shinawat. They also have uh Shaikhse Mitisri, who's a former justice minister, and I think is also much more palatable to the establishment as well, given that he's known to have some conservative links. The uh the 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 question for Shaikhse would be the fact that he's been in poor health over the past few years. So whether or not he's actually a viable candidate for prime minister remains to be seen. There's also other options. For example, Anutin, the leader of Punjai Thai Party, could perhaps emerge as a compromise candidate. Bravit is the, doesn't lead the biggest conservative party, so it, he might find it difficult to be nominated. But the fact that he also has a lot of connections and uh, he and his ability to, you know, twist arms to the Senate might put him, might might do him favors. But at this point, it's still not clear whether or not Bravit has the, um, has enough of support in parliament to, to emerge. You've spoken on the election as a referendum on the last nine years, but could you reflect on the content and effect of the Move Forward Party's electoral strategy and messaging? Did that make a difference or not? And what was it? One of the things that's striking about Move Forward was you think about Thai politics actually campaigning in many in many countries. This is a sort of combination of air war and ground war, right? You have you have your sort of messaging that uh, that's going nationwide. Your sort of brand you're trying to build, uh, and particularly you're usually targeting uh, the, the the party list votes with that. Um, and then you have your sort of um, your ground machine, your vote buying machine, your mobilization machine that you're building from the ground up uh um uh with links to local politicians and local uh local political machines that's that's the that's the that's the, that's the strategy that put has used so so effectively over the last 20 years what's striking about move forward is they pretty much skewed the latter right it was all it was it was all air war and then sort of local um uh, uh local based rallies and uh and sort of um almost like almost like uh proselytory missions right within uh with, at the local level but not very little investment in sort of lo uh, local 
canvassing machinery. Uh, so the use of social media, the, uh, the use of uh, um, the use of social media as a way for them to get their message out unfiltered uh, and a sort of consistent message across the country was was striking. It was it was striking last election, and they doubled down and and were very and, and proved very good at, at that that strategy this uh, this election. A couple of questions with regard to uh, voting. Um, here's we've got a lot of questions, which is really encouraging, but I'm afraid we're going to run out of time before we can answer them all. So uh, this concerns vote buying. And uh, the questioner says uh, the Move Forward Party has had an anti vote buying policy. Uh, does its victory mean vote buying is becoming less effective? That so part of, part of that depends on your vote. But yeah, so it was not less common this election. Um, uh, in part driven by Boom Jai Tai, who annoyed everybody by spending uh, everywhere we heard we heard about the 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 um, the, the massive amounts of money being spent by Boom Jai Tai Boom Jai Tai candidates um, uh, and be matched by uh, the the other conservative parties and to some extent uh, Pu Tai. Um, the uh, um, uh, move forward, not involved in that. Uh, I guess where I'd quibble with the, the with the question is, I don't think it's actually ever been very effective, or at least for the last twenty years, it's not been very effective. It's common, uh, but it it uh, those the, the the people who are targeted with those funds tend to be people who are already uh, inclined to vote for the party. Right? This is uh, you target your supporters. This is a reward and encouragement to turn out. But it but. It, Rarely, at least in my view, did it actually change the outcome of who people voted for. So I don't think this has ever been really effective. It's just been, you know, it's part and parcel of what 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 politics is. It's kind of the white noise in the in the background. Um, so I don't think this was it was any less effective. I don't think it was any to say it was less effective this time doesn't mean it was ever very effective. But what is striking is that Pumchai Tai really counted on its big its deep pockets and as its attempt to create a national a sort of ground up uh, uh, ground war canvassing network and they they failed to produce the kind of results that they hoped to produce with that um, now again I don't um, I, I think it was likely they weren't going to be super successful with that anyway um, but um, but they certainly um, uh, they certainly underperformed given what they had hoped to do with that with with those deep pockets and that and that national network David Timberman wants to know to what extent were perceptions of the monarchy another source of the broad dissatisfaction with the last nine years that the speakers have pointed to? That's a great question. It's one that's hard to answer in any systematic way because we just can't ask the question, right? Um, this is one of the frustrating things about doing Thailand is um, we have anecdotes, we have people we talk to, we have hushed conversations sometimes with, uh, with Thai colleagues. But we can't ask the question uh, via public opinion polls or other 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 more systematic ways how people feel about the monarchy. We have guesses. We have uh, we uh, we have inferences. We we draw. Certainly, there was uh, I think if, if the protests are any uh, indication that there was there was frustration with uh, the way the monarchy has been deployed uh, in defense of certain policies and the way that one one two has been uh, the Majesty has been employed to jail critics of the regime. Uh, you know how broad that, that those sentiments, uh, how broad and deep those sentiments are. It, it's again just hard to know um, because we can't ask the question. Well, here's one uh, kind of intriguing uh, from an anonymous attendee. What is to be made of reports that monopolists? I'm not quite sure what is meant by that. Maybe business monopolists, perhaps. What is meant to? What is to be made of reports that monopolists are now working to prevent the formation? of a move forward party led government. So move forward had campaigned on a uh, a 3D policy to so democratize, demilitarize and sort of demonopolize and what what Peter was referring to was the fact that Thailand's economy is dom dominated by big business but big monopolies that uh that move forward now wants to break up or at least reduce an influence. I I mentioned earlier that right after the move forward party won the election, the stock market in Thailand had a sharp downturn and Part of it reflects, you know, concern about move forward's inexperience, especially in the economic realm. But I think the other part also reflects the the concerns that big businesses now have about what move forward is going to do to them, about you know what legislation they're going to try to pass that's going to reduce the influence of these monopolies. So far, the uh, the move forward party has, I believe, said that, for example, some certain mergers and deals between big businesses will be will be allowed to sail through that they wouldn't go back and you know and touch that but they definitely is going to try to you know to pass legislation that reduces monopoly influence in the future 
And I wouldn't be entirely surprised if, you know, big businesses are working behind the scenes in trying to convince, you know, an alternative coalition to take place simply because they move forward with the most stridently uh, anti-monopoly out of all the major parties. And it wouldn't be in their interest to see a government led by move forward. Did the unhappiness of the United States, among other countries, with the military dominated regime have any impact on the election? I don't think so, in part because I'm not sure how unhappy the U.S. actually was in practice. I mean, there was <laughs> uh, initially there was, you know, there were some consequences. But um, uh, since the 2019 election, it's pretty much been business as as, as usual in terms of uh, U.S. Thai relationships. I mean, they've they've never uh, they, they've never fully reached where, where they were before the coup. But in terms of normal ties, normal relationships. So the, the, the U.S. I, I, I think played very little role, both rather in terms of rhetoric supporting uh, um, uh, supporting uh, you know certain kinds of votes, or in terms of a campaign issue. I just uh, other than sort of some folks worried that a move forward uh, uh, election could uh, uh, lead to foreign policy that tilted towards the U.S. I, I just just didn't didn't hear that personally in in uh, really any of the any of the campaigning that I observed. Or um, even any of the any of the debates uh, um, that I that I that I pay attention to. But can you? I don't know if you you came across anything different. I agree with your with your answer. I think that I mean, some observers have said that the U.S. Thai alliance has been has almost become an alliance in name only. That you know, other regional partners like Vietnam have become have taken Thailand's place as a as you know, more important partners to the U.S. Simply because Thailand maintains strong you know friendly ties with China that other ASEAN countries don't have to the same extent. But I don't I don't know how much a move forward government would actually change this. So we know that Pita has, you know, said he's more he's going to pursue a values-based diplomacy, but at the same time he's also said that he's not going to move Thailand into the US camp or into the China camp. And it's so I I don't know if, if the US actually have, you know, a strong horse in this race. This is a very intriguing question <clears throat> from KT Kwok. Please make a comparison with recent Malaysian elections and their political situation. Can Pita be the Thai Anwar Ibrahim to bring the country forward? Um, that's a great, uh, uh, a great comparison, and I would, uh, um, uh, my call, one of our colleagues. Um, uh, Napodin, uh, who's at ISIS, Dr. Napodin is um, has just written some some interesting work comparing those two elections. So uh, here, here's I think where we where where the, there's some points of commonality. So one is the um, is the uh, uh, the sort of youth uh, the, the momentum the, uh, uh, from sort of youth uh, for reform. That's uh, certainly a um, uh, you know a, a commonality across the two elections. Um, the sort of a vote for uh, for change, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, a desire for structural reform uh, is um, a commonality. Uh, but those two elections, uh, there, there's sort of two big differences. So one, the uh, the, the ethnic uh, cleavages in Malaysia complicate things in really fundamental ways that, um, in, in Thailand's case, just aren't there. Um, uh, so in some ways, makes makes Anwar's. Uh, uh, Anwar's job much harder. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, Malaysia is not dealing with a recalcitrant military that, um, that 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 views itself as an independent player in Thai politics, in the way that that that, that PTA is. And so, uh, I, I think both cases we see the last elections as a vote for reform and a vote for change. Um, uh, but for different reasons, both uh, sort of uh, winning uh, reformist coalitions face tough going uh, in terms of being able to actually push through a reform agenda. What credentials for leadership does Toxin's daughter have? <laughs> well, if we have to be honest, not much. Uh, she was in private business for the majority of her career. And then I think in the past year, she uh, she began taking a leadership role in the Puyatai Party as the head of something called, I think initially as, as something called, you know, Puyatai's advisor on innovation or something like that. And then she became something called the head of the Puyatai family, <clears throat> which... It, it was a an ambiguous role, separate from the party leader, but clearly, you know, informally more powerful. But so to her credit, she's been in politics for longer than uh, Yingluck, Toxin's sister, when she entered politics right before the election and then 
ran an election, became prime minister. So Pedantan has been in, you know, in the party for a little bit longer. But aside from that, I don't, I don't believe she has any experience in government or in policymaking. To be okay. fair, you know, it's been nine years where that wasn't a possibility. So, yeah. uh, you know, um, yeah. So, so the, uh, that, 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 that there, even if she'd wanted to for the last nine years, that hasn't been an option. So, yep. Here's one from an anonymous attendee. Why did the military allow the opposition to compete in the elections? Uh, that's a great question. So why do why do why do military regimes hold elections at all, right? And then in this case, I think the decision was really made in 2019, right? Do we you know we continue just to to delay elections, but it just becomes really costly to do that. Um, the longer you delay, the more uh, the the more you have to face um, public protests, the more pressure you're going to get internationally. A move to sort of stop the election or to ban the opposition parties uh, would, uh, I think the calculation would be too costly, right? That they hoped that the institutions and, and whether they had in place to sort of check the excesses of uh, any opposition victory uh, would be enough, to, would be enough. And that's what they're still counting on, right? So even if the opposition did well, they expected for the tie to work what they would do well. A, some people thought they could work with Puyatai. B, they still have the Senate uh, that can, and other institutions that are in place to try and rein in uh, those opposition politicians and minimize the threat that they pose. I would also emphasize that the military had already been in power for far longer than I think anybody had anticipated when it launched the coup in 2014. In the wake of the military coup, Bayut released a pop song because, you know, despite the fact he's busy running the country, apparently he had time to pen the lyrics to a pop song that where he asked for, you know, just a short amount of time to uh, restore the country. And, and in the end, that short amount of time became a year, then two years, and then finally it became, you know, almost five years before he had an election. So I think that there was already already a lot of uh, dissatisfaction and a lot of, a lot of desire for, you know, an, an opportunity to express some opinion in Brute's role. And the fact that he was there able to delay this for four or five years, I think, was already quite a feat. This is a longer question, which I will uh, reduce in length a little bit here. But it's an important question. Um, after the 20, oh, sorry, uh, according to the 2017 Constitution, after the 2029 elections, the Senate will not participate in the appointment of a prime minister. Now, given this, the questioner wonders if this might make more likely, either on the one hand, a new constitution. Uh, that would change that provision, or perhaps a coup that would prevent it altogether. So uh, that that's uh, that's technically not correct. So actually, the uh, the, the provision for the Senate having a vote uh, is actually a five as it was a five year um, a five year provision. So it actually expires about a year from now. Um, so uh, so one scenario is um, uh, regardless whether it's Puyatai or um, uh, or uh, uh, move forward uh, at the at the helm. That um, that in uh, then a year's time we either have a push for a serious constitutional amendment or a push for a new election without the Senate looming as the as the veto player. The uh, this, the the Constitution is devilishly hard to amend. It's almost impossible to amend in its in its current form. Uh, if if we're going to see constitutional reform, it's either going to be you know via coup, which is not unusual, or um, an attempt to, you know, legislation that, that puts on the ballot a constitutional, uh, a, a constitutional um, uh, referendum uh, that, that sort of sets up a legislative, a referendum legislative process to start the, start the amendment process all over again, similar to what we saw in the mid-1990s. I think okay. that what's possible in, the, in, in this parliament is that, so in the previous parliament, there wasn't enough support to, act, to amend the constitution to make it easier to amend. Sounds complicated, but there, there were a lot of attempts to try to, you know, lower the bar, lower the number of votes that would be needed to actually fix the constitution. But in the last election, when, you know, Bayut still had a majority, it was very hard to uh, get enough votes, vote in the lower house and the Senate to try to, uh, to try to do this. Although there was a lower house majority for it, but the Senate blocked it. This time around, given that, you know, there's a much bigger pro-amendment number of seats, I, I think that it, we could probably perhaps see some change in that direction. Uh, but Again, it, it's very much up in the air. This question is from Kevin Zhang. It says, hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. Kevin here <laughs> from Isis Yusuf Ishak Institute. May you explain why the Deep South did not support Move Forward Party 
even though the party campaigned for demilitarization and greater autonomy for the Deep South. I think two key reasons. The Deep South went for mostly for the Bershashat Party, which is, you know, a party led by former Deputy Prime Minister uh, Wan Muhab Nam Atta, who is a who is Muslim, who's from the Deep South, and I think, you know, has much more of ethnic appeal there. Secondly, I think some of the move forward policies don't align well with the Deep South at all. For example, they campaigned for marriage equality, for legalizing uh, same-sex marriage, which is something that uh, conservatives in the Deep South are not entirely comfortable with. They also campaigned for something called the progressive liquor policy that would have uh, made it much easier for people to uh, start uh, beer or alcohol brewing businesses in Thailand. And that was something that uh, the Rastashat party had also opposed this. So they're, despite their stances on demilitarization, their social policies, their progressive policies don't quite align well with the values of the Deep South. Now that we're at the end of the program, I want to thank uh, uh, Alan and I want to thank Ken, both of you. Uh, terrific. I thought it was absolutely outstanding, as evidenced, I might say, by the extremely large number of questions that we received. I think it's maybe even a record for at least for the last year or so. It's extraordinary. And I think it's a consequence of not just the importance of what is happening right now in Thailand, but it's also a consequence, it seems to me, of uh, their appreciation of your expertise. And uh, I'm sure that, that they're leaving this satisfied with the intellectual stimulation that you have so kindly provided. Thank you so much. Very, very, very appreciative of that. Thanks for having us. All right. Thank you. All the best. And all the best to Thailand. <laughs>